The Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature, by William James, continues its ninth chapter with, As I sat there thinking, I seemed to feel some great and mighty presence. I did not know then what it was. I did learn afterwards that it was Jesus, the sinner's friend. I walked up to the bar and pounded it with my fist till I made the glasses rattle. Those who stood by drinking looked on with scornful curiosity. I said I would never take another drink if I died on the street and I really felt as though that would happen before morning. Something said, if you want to keep this promise, Go and have yourself locked up. When I went to the nearest station house, I had myself locked up. I was placed in a narrow cell, and it seemed as though all the demons that could find room came into that place with me. This was not all the company I had either. No praise the Lord, that dear spirit that came to me in the saloon was present and said, pray. I did pray and thought I did not feel any great help. I kept on praying. As soon as I was able to leave my cell, I was taken to the police court and remanded back to the cell. I was finally released and found my way to my brother's house, where every care was given me. While lying in bed, the admonishing spirit never left me. And when I arose the next Sabbath morning, you know, they mean Sunday, I'm sure. Uh, I felt that the day would decide my fate, and toward the evening it came into my head to go to Jerry Maoli's mission. I went. The house was packed, and with a great difficulty I made my way to the space near the platform. There I saw the apostle, the drunkard, and the outcast, that man of God, Jerry Maoli. He rose, and amid deep silence, told his experience. There was a sincerity about this man that carried conviction with it, and I found myself saying, I wonder if God can save me. I listened to the testimony of 25 or 30 persons, every one of whom had been saved from rum, and I made up my mind that I would be saved or die right there. When the invitation was given, I knelt down with a crowd of drunkards. Jerry made the first prayer. Then Mrs. Maoli prayed fervently for us. Oh, what a conflict was going on for my poor soul. A blessed whisper said, Come, the devil said, be careful. I halted but a moment, and then, with a breaking heart, I said, Dear Jesus, can you help me? Never with mortal tongue can I describe that moment, although up to that moment my soul had been filled with an indescribable gloom. I felt the glorious brightness of the noonday sun shine into my heart. I felt I was a free man. Oh, the precious feeling of safety, of freedom, of resting on Jesus. I felt that Christ, with all his brightness and power, had come into my life, that, indeed, old things had passed away, and all things had become new. From that moment till now, I have never wanted a drink of whiskey, and I have never seen any money enough to make me take one. I promised God that night that if he would take away the appetite for strong drink, I would work for him all my life. He has done his part, and I have been trying to do mine. And William James abridged Mr. Hadley's account for other conversions of drunkards. See his pamphlet, Rescue Mission Work, published at the Old Jerry Maoli Water Street Mission, New York City. A striking collection of cases also appears in the appendix to Professor Luba's article. And, of course, one of the things about that is that in any different context, like Aleister Crowley's The Diary of a Drug Fiend, uh, such experiences like that happen, but you don't necessarily experience it to whatever um, God is available to worship, or whatever thing you think is a God available to worship, right? Dr. Luba rightly remarks that there is little doctrinal theology in such an experience, which starts with the absolute need of a higher helper, and ends with the sense that he has helped us. He gives us other cases of drunkards, conversions, which are purely ethical, containing, as recorded, no theological beliefs, whatever. Of course, it's more likely when there are theological beliefs 
connected to it, but John B. Goff's case, or Gal's case, or however you pronounce that, uh, for instance, is practically, says Lupa, the conversion of an atheist, neither God nor Jesus being mentioned. Uh, a restaurant waiter served professionally as Go's savior. General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, considers that the first vital step in saving outcasts consists in making them feel that some decent human being cares enough for them to take an interest in the question whether they are to rise or sink. But in spite of the imp as long as they're not some sociopathic psycho vampire or something, right? Um, but in spite of the importance of this type of regeneration, with little or no intellectual readjustment, this writer surely makes it too exclusive. It corresponds to the subjectively centered form of morbid melancholy of which Bunyan and Aline were examples. But we saw in our seventh lecture that there are objective forms of melancholy also in which the lack of rational meaning of the universe and of life anyhow is the burden that weighs upon one. You remember Tolstoy's case, the crisis of apathetic melancholy, no use in life, into which J.S. Mill records that he fell and from which he has emerged by the reading of Marmontel's memoirs, heaven save the mark, and Wordsworth's poetry, another is another intellectual and general metaphysical case. See Mill's autobiography, New York, 1873, pages 141 and 148. So there are distinct elements in conversion, and their relations to individual lives deserve to be discriminated. Starbuck, in addition to escape from sin, discriminates spiritual illumination as a distinct type of conversion experience. Psychology of Religion, page 85. Some persons, for ex instance, never are and, pars and possibly never under any circumstances could be converted. Religious ideas cannot become the center of their spiritual energy. They may be excellent persons, servants of God in practical ways, but they are not children of his kingdom. They are either incapable of imagining the invisible. Well, if you're imagining the invisible, then you're not um, experiencing the unseen worlds, right? Or else, in the language of devotion, they are lifelong subjects of barrenness and dryness. Such an aptitude for religious faith may in some cases be intellectual in its origin. The religious faculties may be checked in their natural tendency to expand by beliefs about the world that are inhibitive. The pessimistic materialistic beliefs, for example, within which so many good souls who in former times would have freely indulged their religious propensities find themselves nowadays, as it were, frozen, or the agnostic vetoes upon faith as something weak and shameful, under which so many of us today lie, cowering, afraid to use our instincts, and many persons such inhibitions are never overcome. To the end of their days, they refuse to believe. Their personal energy never gets to its religious center, and the latter remains inactive in perpetuity. In other persons, the trouble is profounder. There are men, an aesthetic on the religious side, deficient in that category of sensibility, just as a bloodless organism can never be, in spite of all its goodwill, attain to the reckless animal spirits enjoyed by those sanguine temperament. So, the nature which is spiritually barren may admire and envy faith in others, but can never compass the enthusiasm and peace which those who are temperamentally qualified for faith enjoy. All this may, however, turn out eventually to have been a matter of temporary inhibition. Even late in life, some thaw, some release may take place, some bolt be shot back in the barrenness breast, and man's hard heart may soften and break into religious feeling. Such cases, more than any others, suggest the idea that sudden conversion is by miracle. So long as they exist, we must not imagine ourselves to deal with irretrievably fixed classes. Now there are two forms of mental occurrence in human beings which lead to a striking difference in the conversion process, a difference to which Professor Starbuck has called attention. You know how it is when you try to recollect a forgotten name. Usually you help the recall by working for it, by mentally running over the places, persons, and things with which the word is connected. But sometimes this effort fails. You feel then as if the harder you tried, the less hope there would be, as though the name were jammed and pressure in its direction only kept it all the more from rising and then the opposite expedient often succeeds. Give up the effort entirely, think of something altogether different, and in half an hour, 
Lost name comes sauntering into your mind, as Emerson says, as carelessly as if it had never been invited. And we find that people who take breaks, like like monks or Muslims or something, that, oh, the prayer time has come, or the time for service has come, drop everything and get to the service, they actually have more uh, of the memory and or whatever to do their story or their problem or... or you know, whatever. Um, some hidden process was started in you by the effort which went on after the effort ceased and made the result come as if came spontaneously. A certain music teacher, says Dr. Starbuck, says to her pupils after the thing to be done has been clearly pointed out and unsuccessfully attempted, stop trying and it will do itself. Psychology of Religion, page 117. There is thus... A a conscious and voluntary way, and an involuntary and unconscious way in which mental results may get accomplished, and we find both ways exemplified in the history of conversion, and giving us two types, which Starbuck calls the volitional type and the type by self-surrender, respectively. In the volitional type, the regenerative change is usually gradual and consists in the building up piece by piece of a new set of moral and spiritual habits. But there are always critical points here at which the movement forward seems much more rapid. The psychological fact is abundantly illustrated by Dr. Starbuck. Our education in any practical accomplishment proceeds apparently by jerks and starts, just as the growth of our physical bodies does. And in Psychology of Religion, page 385, see also pages 137 to 114, uh, uh, to 144 and 262, an athlete sometimes awakens suddenly to an understanding of the fine points of the game and to a real enjoyment of it, just as the convert awakens to an appreciation of religion. If he keeps on engaging in the sport, there may come a day when all at once the game plays itself through him, when he loses himself in some great contest. In the same way, a musician may suddenly reach a point at which pleasure in the technique of the art entirely falls away, and in some moment of inspiration he becomes the instrument through which music flows. The writer has chanced to hear two different married persons, both of whose wedded lives have been beautiful from the beginning, relate that not until a year or more after marriage did they awake to the full blessedness of married life. And nowadays, people don't even really give marriage a chance. They just, you know, some selfish trying to corral someone in um, and, you know, not be really partners or anything just you know um are they give up on being partners all together and just well it's, whenever it's convenient for us to come together and everybody runs around and um you know but any anyway so uh, you know uh so it is with the religious experience of these persons we are studying we shall and then we go on here um we shall ere long hear still more remarkable illustrations of subconsciously maturing processes, eventuating in the results of which we suddenly grow conscious. Sir William Hamilton and Professor Laycock, not the professor, not the Laycock of the Enochian Dictionary that I talk about, of, of Edinburgh, were among the first to call attention to this class of effects. But Dr. Carpenter first, unless I am mistaken, introduced the term unconscious celebration which has since then been a popular phrase of explanation. The facts are now known to us far more extensively than he could know them, and the adjective unconscious being for many of them almost certainly a misnomer, it is better replaced by the vaguer term subconscious or subliminal. Of the volitional type of conversion, it would be easy to give examples, but they are, as a rule, less interesting than those of the self-surrender type in which the subconscious effects are more abundant and often startling. For instance, C.G. Finley italicizes the volitional element just as this point, just at this point, the whole question of gospel salvation opened to my mind in a manner most marvelous to me at the time. I think I then saw as clearly as I ever have in my life the reality and fullness of the atonement of Christ gospel salvation seemed to me to be an offer of something to be accepted 
and all that was necessary on my part was to get my own consent to give up my sins and accept Christ. After this distinct revelation had stood for some little time before my mind, the question seemed to be put, will you accept it now, today? I replied, yes, I will accept it today, or I will die in the attempt. He then went into the woods where he describes his struggles. He could not pray. His heart was hardened in its pride. I then reproached myself for having promised to give my heart to God before I had left the woods. When I came to try, I found I could not. My inward soul hang, hung back, and there was no going out of my heart to God. The thought was pressing me of the rashness of the promise that I would give my heart to God that day, or die in the attempt. It seemed to me as if it was binding on my soul, and yet I was going to break my vow. A great sinking and discouragement came over me, and I felt almost too weak to stand upon my knees. Just at this moment, I again thought I heard someone approach me, and I opened my eyes to see whether it were so. But right there, the revelation of my pride of heart, as the great difficulty that stood in the way was distinctly shown to me, an overwhelming sense of my wickedness in being ashamed to have a human being see me on my knees before God, took such powerful possession of me. And people are more likely to bother you for, a, for being in a prayer position in the Bible Belt than they are outside the Bible Belt, at least in my experience. Um, that I cried at the top of my voice and exclaimed that I would not leave that place if all the men on earth and all the devils in hell surrounded me. What, I said, such a degraded sinner as I am, on my knees confessing my sins to the great and holy God, and ashamed to have any human being and a sinner like myself find me on my knees, endeavoring to make my peace with my offended God. The sin appeared awful, infinite. It broke me down before the Lord. Memoirs, page 14 through 16. Now, I personally wouldn't recommend this, uh, I'm a sinner approach, but, um... That's sort of the thing for so many people, right? Um, I will therefore hurry. Uh, I'm, I'm continuing outside the note. I will therefore hurry to the latter. The more being so, the difference between the two types is, after all, not radical. Even the most voluntary, built-up sort of regeneration. There are passages of partial self-surrender interposed. And in the great majority of all cases, when... Will has done its uttermost towards bringing one close to the complete unification aspired after. It seems that the very last step must be left to other forces and performed without the help of its activity. In other words, self-surrender becomes then indispensable. The personal will, says Dr. Starbuck, must be given up. In many cases, relief persistently refuses to come until the person ceases to resist, uh, to resist or to make effort in the direction he desires to go. And... Here's a quote here. I had, I had said I would not give it up. But when my will was broken, it was all over, writes one of Starbuck's correspondents. Another says, I simply said, Lord, I have done all I can. I leave the whole matter with thee. And immediately there came to me great peace. Another, all at once, it occurred to me that I might be saved too. If I would stop trying to do it all myself and follow Jesus. Well... Is following Jesus the same as worshiping Jesus? Leave that to you to answer. Somehow I lost my load. Another, I finally ceased to resist and gave myself up. Although it was a hard struggle, gradually the feeling came over me that I had done my part, and God was willing to do his. Starbuck, page 91 and 114. Lord, thy will be done. Damn or save, cries John Nelson. In his extracts of the journal of Mr. John Nelson, London, no date, page 24. Exhausted with the anxious struggle to escape damnation, and at that moment his soul was filled with peace. And I... Yeah, I guess I'll stop.